Okay, welcome everybody. My name is David Cox and I will be talking to you today about using a thing called convert to method pairs to help you make cross-platform applications easier both to build and to maintain. Now I love the, the cross-platform capabilities of Zojo and it can be easy. I wish it was even easier, but if you do create cross-platform applications, you have to beware because some approaches to this are better than others. So, how does it start for me? Usually it starts with this pattern. Somebody comes to me and says, David, can you build me just a Windows app? And I say, yes, and I build it. But then later on they come back after I've done that and say, oh, you built a 32-bit version, can you build a 64-bit version? Not a problem. Uh, well, now I know you can do Windows, can you make a Mac OS version or a Linux version or a Raspberry Pi? And I say, possibly for no extra work, you know, sort of all these things are possible. But then they come back and they go, oh, our admin, they, they use web apps. Can you build a web app version of the application? And then the, the, they, then the marketing people go out and find out that the customers want an iPhone version of your application. And then they go, oh, well, hang on, there's more Android out there. Can you do an Android version of your application as well? So... If you have a client, it's very unlikely, but if you did have a client who wanted you to build a Zojo app with the lot, there are about 55 possible targets, even excluding the fact that you can't really do 32-bit mobile apps anymore. You see, there's desktop apps, web apps, and mobile apps. Then you have to multiply this, not only by the 64, 32-bit, but we have to build for Intel and ARM, potentially, as well as creating universal versions. When I create my own apps, I usually also have a version for the App Store, which often removes certain functions, like sort of check for updates. So to do all of this properly, even just to build an application, I've had to write a Zojo script which will build to all of the different um, uh, build types that, that, I, that I need for that particular customer. And that just setting it running and jumping between the application, the, the different projects, the, at Aggressive, it can take over half an hour just the build process for all the different types that I need. <clears throat> but what I want to focus on today is the location of your source code. You see, we can place our source code into our applications in about 12 possible locations. There's not only the different projects like desktop, web, iOS, and Android, but within these, we can place our source code inside the object itself, like in a buttons open event or something. Uh, well, we, we can also create it inside a method in a window. We can also put it, your coding can go into an external method or even in the app, you know, sort of function, you, you, you have different uh, places for methods. If you're creating a web app, you've got session which can take um, uh, methods. So many different possible places that you can place your source code. Okay, now, we can often get economies of scale by building something like a window or a container and putting the code in it and making it external. And that saves us a bit. But it doesn't help us when we want to take that container or that web page and make it cross-platform. 
because the containers and the web pages are different from one to another. So very quickly, our project, our cross-platform project, can become a nightmare to maintain. Especially if you do have to update your code in 12 possible different locations and have it work on 55 possible targets in the end. So, this is how I used to begin. I used to begin with what I know, object oriented. I would put the code into, into each of the objects as much as possible, like inside a button if they clicked it. But then I found that I was getting a lot of distribution, in fact mass distribution. Every button often had the same sort of code in it. So then what I did is I moved my code into external methods so that they would be shared, removing the, the, the duplication. But now my code was split. I still had to have something inside the button to say, go off and talk to this external module. So now my code was split between an external module or a class and the actual button itself. The other problem was not all of my code was cross-platform. Or even if it was cross-platform, it might not work exactly the same way. A desktop list box does not always work the same as a web list box or sometimes they don't even exist like on, on mobile. So then I started going, okay, well if target desktop do this, if target web do that. So you can see that within not a long time, all I was trying to do was tame this dreadful beast of, main, uh, of having a huge amount of, uh, of code in a lot of different places for a lot of different platforms. And it became a pain to actually have to maintain all of that. There had to be an easier way to do it than what I was doing. And there is. The way I found to do it was to actually treat Zojo as a, a bit like you have a front end and a back end, even though it's all within one program. So the front end in interface is what's in the middle of each of your projects. And in the end, the front end, which we typically put all of the code into our front end, is actually a skeleton. <coughs> skeleton with windows with the same names and containers. And what we do is we, it only has about 1% of the, instead of 90% of the code, now it's only got about 1% of the code. Now, what we do is we have an external class linked to that window or linked to that container that has about 90% of the code. And this is an external class, so it's shared uh, across the different environments. And then at the back end, we can have ex other external classes or methods for generic functions that aren't related to this particular window. They're just things that you might need to look up and call and do. Okay. <clears throat> Now we do all of this, the reason why, why we're able to do this is using a thing called method pairs. Now, a method pair, just don't, don't bother reading it yet, I'll try and explain it to you first and then I'll go through it in details. So a method pair, as we'll show you later, you probably never even saw it within Zojo, but it's always been there. Um, and also, I've given, I've given Christian a copy of all these slides, so uh, you, you, you can see the details later. Um, anyway, a method pair allows you to define incompatible objects within a single class, and then within that class, you use them as per normal. Per, per normal within that class, or even access them externally. For example, we can define a button object in the class and share that class amongst all the environments, desktop, web, and mobile. But when it runs on the desktop, all it sees is the definition of that button as a desktop button. When we run it on the web, 
it sees the definition of this method class as, as a web button. When we run it on mobile, it, all it sees is the mobile button. So normally incompatible things are able to exist side by side in our one class. Okay, so I'll go through the details now. Say for example, on your web page, you had a, a pop-up menu called uh, category. You called it category pop-up menu. And so that's physically what's on the, on the, on the, um, on the, on the page, whether it's on the, um, desktop page, whether it's, yeah, sorry, desktop window, whether it's on the web page, you have a thing with the same name called category pop-up. So you, the naming needs to be consistent across each of the environments. So we go and create a property in our class called category pop-up menu. Now, you've probably done that before, de defined particular uh, properties for objects within a class. That's fairly normal. But probably what you haven't done when you go into your list of the properties, right-clicked on that object and seen there's a little thing down, down near the bottom called convert to method pair. When you do that, we now get, it splits it in two. It puts an M in front of the name, so what was called category pop-up menu is now called M category pop-up menu. Seems a little weird, but it does actually make sense. And then what it's also done when you go convert to method pair is it's put a new line into your methods area above the properties. So you have properties down below and you have your methods up above and we've got a new type of method up the top there. Now, I don't want, when I, when I go and put it in and convert to method pair, if I'm working on a desktop, I'll have this, I'll have my category pop-up menu is defined as a desktop pop-up menu. But I don't want just desktop pop-up menu. So when I do that, I then duplicate it and put, I just put the word at the end, desktop. I duplicate it and put another one as, as being mobile and then duplicate it again and put the word web at the end. So now instead of just one property that I've got for that defined object, I've now got three. And I need to go and change their names. So the first one is, is, is of type desktop pop-up menu. Second one, now, there are no pop-up menus for mobile, so I use Graffiti Suite, and it uses a thing called Graffiti Pop-up Menu. The third one is Web Pop-up Menu, which does exist on the web. Now, if I went and compiled my application at this stage, it would fail on all platforms, because the desktop version of my project, when it's got this class in it, is going to go, I don't know what a web pop-up menu is. If I compile my web, it's going to go, I don't know what a desktop, uh, desktop pop-up menu is. So what we need to do is for each of those items, come into the include in section for each of those objects and say, look, click on the one for desktop and turn everything off except for desktop. Click on the web, turn off everything except for the web objects. Click on the mobile, turn everything off except for, in this case, iOS. Then it'll compile and when it compiles, what's going to happen is it's not going to compile the ones that are outside of its scope. So everything should be fine. It should now compile. The trouble is that what is it now going to return to my application? So when we so we can now close down the properties and come up to the methods area. And we can see when we built these that, that it, it created th the three different types within our methods area. We, they're all under the same name. They've all got the same name here. And we've got one which is uh, defining this category pop-up menu as a desktop, one as a web and one as a graffiti pop-up pop menu. And again, we need to do the same thing, just like we did in the properties, 
define the scope only for its area. Same here, for the methods, we need to click on each one and say desktop is only for desktop, web is only for web, mobile is only for mobile. Then, when it actually needs to uh, assign an object, when my code needs to call it, what we, what, that's when this comes in. So we need to go, what am I, when it's called, what's it going to return? So in, normally it would say, assigns a value, desktop pop-up menu. We need to change that to object, so it's generic. And then put in to what it's going to, how it's going to return the value. It's going to take that value as type object. And if I'm on a desktop, it's going to return a desktop pop-up menu, menu version of that value. If I'm on the web, it'll return a web pop-up menu of that value. And same thing on iOS. In this case, it's going to re return a graffiti pop-up menu. If it's none, none of those matches, then break. Now, that is phenomenally complex, and I'm sorry, that, but the advantage is we only need to do this once. And I'll get on to later, I'll show you how it can become a lot easier. What it means is that from now on within this class, I don't need to worry about all of these properties and all of these different types of names. It's all, that has already been set up. Now, all I need to do is run different events for it. So I can have, okay, if this code um, category pop-up menu selection changed event happens, what does it do? And so that, wh whether I'm sitting on a de running on a desktop app or whether I'm running on a web app or running on a, on a mobile app, that event, that selection changed event will fire. It will pass whatever the object is as an object. And in this case, it needed, I can't remember what, I, th I think that's what particular li line it is. And then you can have any other events that you might need uh, to, to run as well. In addition, so that is just for the object itself that appears on your page and the actual events. But in amongst all of this can also be your code. You can have code to go, okay, when the person clicks on a button and it needs to go up and look up a database and, or look at different objects and fields, that, that other code will be in amongst all of this as well as you'll, see, as you'll see later. So in other words, the whole of the intelligence of your application per window is within, within a class for each window. So, what have we really done here? So we, these are the different environments. At the moment, iOS and Android are two separate projects, but those will sometime be turning into one. But cu the current state we're at at the moment is that we need to create these as separate skeleton applications, where if you have a, you, you, so in other words, we have um, four identical interfaces. Say, for example, we have a label and then uh, a text field and a button here for the desktop. On the web, we have a, la a web label, a field, button, and same thing iOS, same thing Android. Four separate interfaces, one for web, one for, I one for desktop, one for iOS, one for Android. Okay, and then we create one class, one external class that is linked, that, that, is, uh, that links inside each of those particular um, uh, interface areas. Okay, <clears throat> then um, so we've already done that where we created, in this case, three sets of, so for example, for login name, you'll need to have the, uh, uh, the desktop te text area, web text area, mobile text area. And then within this class, we need to point th that object that we've defined in the class back to the particular page. 
So we'll have defined in here that we have a, uh, the person's login name and that is on this particular window with such and such a name. Same thing, this window, that name, this window, that name. So we now def have defined, not only defined the object, but pointed it back to the originating window or container. Once we've now got our, our defined objects on there and they're all working, then we want, to, so that's the, the section here, then we want to put all of our events in here our, and we use the add handler for that. So in the, in the example that I'm doing, we want for our text area here, our login name for example, we want to add an ad handler where whenever the text is changed, it goes off and runs a method within the class called, say, login name text changed. So that way, text changed, that event name is exactly the same name were it on desktop or web or iOS or Android. And so it's just one line in our class, one ad handler, and now, as soon as anybody changes any text, it's go off, going to go off and run that particular method. Okay, so now, all, uh, all of the other methods and things that we have can be added on the end of that to make sure that if we need to do anything more complex, that's all possible. It, it seems complex, but I can tell you it will save your life a lot further down the, a lot, yeah. Life will be better further down the track and I'll show you in a very simple application how it works. So what are the downsides of using this technique? The downsides are that it's not really suitable for when you're just tackling one environment. If, you're only, if you're, the application you're creating is only going to be for desktop or only ever going to be for web, don't bother doing what I've shown you here. Um, it, it'll put, put all the code inside the objects, methods wherever you want. It also, another downside is it takes a while to set up all of the different interfaces and they have, you know, each setting up and designing a container on desktop and the same container name and objects on web and same thing on, uh, on iOS. So it takes a while to set up the four interfaces. It takes a while to set up all the definitions of them and I'll show you some hints later as to how you can make that easier. Another downside is if you go and change an object name, so you ch you've got you know, your buttons and your text fields are all identical names, if you go and change one on your interface, well it's now going to break your code. It'll be fine for one, might be fine for one application, but the other ones are going to go, well I don't have a button called that, and uh, so we, we any time you need to go off and change a UI object, put a new one in or change the name of it, you need to change it in all the four environments, desktop, web, iOS and Android. It also means you need to take into account each of the different environments. For example, mobile. Sometimes uh, with, you know, in your methods you need to take account for how one environment works versus another. And even the events, even between desktop and web, the events for you know, for selection change, sometimes uh, returns different numbers of, of parameters in the event from one environment to another. So you have to take that into account. So there's some of the downsides. The upsides are you only need to add or edit or debug your source code once. So if you have it so that when you click on a button and something is supposed to happen, you know exactly where that code is. You change the name of that code or you change the name of some text or whatever it might be, boom, it's now fixed or changed for all of your, your four main environments. You only uh, have to edit your source code in one location 
per window or per container. So that means you know, we, we don't have duplication, we don't have code that you might need to change in all the environments. Also, once we've gone through that pain at the start of defining an object once, it doesn't need to be defined again. It's done within that class whenever you access it. It's, it is a button is a button is a button. Um, if you have objects that are on your windows that don't need to be accessed, you don't need to get the value from them, you don't need to change them or anything like that, you don't actually need to define those objects within your class. It's fine, leave it. So if you have some help text a label at the top of your screen telling people how to use the fields down below, well, you're never actually going to be changing that. Don't bother bringing that as an object into your class because you're never going to be changing it unless later on down the track you decide to. <coughs> Once you've got those objects defined for each of the platforms, then code within your class or even, ex even accessing it externally to your window uh, works as normal. So that category pop-up menu, if you, uh, not only within that class, you can just call it category pop-up menu and do whatever you want with it as a pop-up menu, but also if you had a nut one window talking to another window, you can just talk to that object, that pop-up menu, on that window and the class will take over. The, the class will do everything it's supposed to do because it's, the class has a pointer to it. It also means that your projects become a lot smaller because instead of the same code being in lots of different locations, it's all in one. Your, your, the actual interface side becomes smaller, the class becomes a bit bigger. Searching for problems is also a lot easier because if you find that you do have a problem, instead of having to search in five different areas, it's the, the problem, you know the bug can only be in one area. It's gonna to have to be in that class. Okay, so what are some of the hints? So if you knew that you were having to create a multi-environment application I would just do the development in one of those environments first. The most flexible by far is desktop. So I would create a desktop version of the application first using those techniques that I talked about before, but just do one and get it, get it all working properly. The, um, the advantage of that is that if you did go and move things around onto other containers or other screens or you change their name to be, a, you're not having to go at that stage and change the name four times. Get it right once, get the, app, the desktop version uh, working and then, okay, now move on. Now one of the things that I do to save all of that pain at the start of defining them and going, you know, okay, this one for desktop, this one for web, this one for mobile, um, you, I, I have a separate project which has got all of those predefined in there. So I just call it, you know, MXXXXX whatever text field and I even have, you know, for the, I've got the desktop, the web, the mobile version and I've got, um, even other events like text change. Usually when I have a text field, I'm gonna to wanna to have a text changed. I just go off to this other project, highlight them. They're already set up for each of the environments. I just copy, paste them into my application, search for XXXX text field, change it to last name. Boom. Does a search and replace in my class now all of that work is done within, within about 10 seconds. I now have this, the thing fully defined with my, um, uh, uh, w even with my events ready to go. Now, an another hint is keep the object names clear. If, if somebody's putting in first name, last name, we'll name them first name, last name. Don't have it as text field one, text field two, that sort of thing. Rename it just so it's clear because you're, you're going to be using those names as they are inside the class, separated from the window. So sometimes it might be, um, because you're not in the window anymore, you can't see where the field is necessarily located. So the object name will help you. Um, same with the events. 
if you have a field called uh, my name and you have an event called text changed, then create the event <coughs> method that you're calling in the ad handler. Just call it my name text changed. And that way you'll know, okay, so that's the name of the field, that's the event that's happening. So when, when that event runs, you know what you're doing. In terms of setting things to public and private, back, back in your window, you need to set the scope of all the objects, all the text, anything that you're going to access, all the text fields and buttons and pop-up menus, you set them all to public because you, the class needs them to be able to be public to point that it's variable to them. But anything that's in the class itself is only ever really accessed within the class. So you can set all of the properties if you want, which is what I do. I set all the properties and the methods of all the things within that class to being private because I never need to access them outside of the class. Um, because you work, I work across different environments, I use containers everywhere. You don't necessarily need containers a lot on desktop or web. Um, but you really do on mobile, particularly if you, if you use certain techniques where you need to go and put containers inside page panels and tab panels and things like that. That's the only way to do it on iOS uh, using the Graffiti Suite software. And so I just have, I use the same containers technique on des my desktop and web apps as well. Um, and as I've said down here, I use, if you're, you, if you're going, if you're just doing desktop and web, they're fairly similar. If you are going mobile, then I would suggest you seriously look at getting Graffiti Suite because it does give you a proper looking list box called a Graffiti Grid. It gives you page panels, tab panels, pop-up menus, and a whole host of other things to make uh, your, your programming very similar between the different environments. Okay, so, demo. Let me jump out. So this is a very simple application that I've got, which is running on all of the environments. What you see in the top left-hand corner is the desktop version running. Down here, exactly the same, same skeleton. We need, still need to have four separate projects, each having the same objects in them. But that's the same thing with a, a web environment. Here's exactly the same code on iOS, and there's the same code again running on Android. OK, so what does this application do? Well, if you, you can type in anything, but if you just type some text, you can see that the OK button is grey. If the person does put in, as soon as they put in another, a, a single letter into both the fields, the OK button appears or uh, becomes enabled or disabled. So as soon as you hit OK, a new window comes up, a main window, which presumably you could put things inside there. And when, you, when you're finished, you click Log Out and it goes back to the, to the login menu before. <coughs> Same thing here, if we type some text into the web app, as soon as I type in something else here, we've got the OK button. Let me click on log out and we're back to where we were. Same thing, we've already typed something into there. Type something into the, and click OK. And then we can go back. And if, we, if we're on the Android, type something in and you can see the OK button. So in other words, events are obviously uh, running each time we do text change. I'll go OK and then jump back and go cancel. OK. Let's see, so that's, that's the aim, that, that's a grossly simplified version of what we're aiming at. That we can have all of the four main application environments running with, it, with essentially the same code. So let me quit out of the desktop one and bring it to the front. So this is the desktop version. You can see under here, I've got the method pair desktop, web, iOS and Android, and here's my my, my thing, which I'll go to in a sec, which has got all of the, all of the button on text field type functions all there. Now, if I have a look at my 
desktop and uh, my, my, my two windows. You can see I've called it Win Login. that's pretty normal. And you come down here and you have a look and you go, oh, hang on a tick. How come there's no triangles next to each of these objects? Even the OK button has nothing there. There's no, where's the, where is the code? And you think, oh, OK, well, the code must be in, in the window itself. And you go, hang on a minute, no, it's not. Well, let's have a look at the property. Well, there's a class. Called, I just happen to call, I like calling things, you know, common, common code. So I call it class common window. And then we've got, uh, just call it common window. And then in the open event, all we do is go, OK, call that, create a, that's incredibly small text. Let me uh, make it bigger. Is that big enough for people? I can make it larger if you need. So all we're doing is saying, take that particular class we've got and create a new version of it. Pass off to an object within that class uh, the, the my window itself. So we've got a, we know the class knows where it's coming from, and then go off and run some setup code. I've just called it do setup. You your end my win login. You can call it whatever you want. If we come down to the uh, the main window that it called up, we go come down here and we have a look at the controls. Well, there's only one button and it's got no text added uh, attached to it. We've got exactly the same sort of thing here where we've got a, just one class come up here to the event handler for the window. So when the window opens, okay, it defines that class, gives, in this case, not the login menu, but the main window. It passes itself off to the class and runs a setup. So that's the 1% of code that we have inside the window or the container itself because all the work, all the fancy stuff is sitting inside each of those particular classes. So we have two classes here. One of them is for, for the, uh, the, the login window and the other one is for the, in this case, the main window. So I know that if I've ever got a bug, that the bug is going to be inside this particular, inside the class. So what on earth do, do we have inside the class? So if I open up properties, you go, whoa, we've got a whole heap of different funny looking properties there. And you, but you'll notice that, OK, so we've got three lots of a cancel button, three lots of a password, and three lots of a username. So let me come back here. So there we go. There's username, there's password, there's an OK button, and there's cancel. So you can see them defined there on the on the left-hand side in the properties. Now, you never need to come down and have a look at them. Oh, there's the window, by the way. What, we never really need to come down here. The, the, the cool stuff is all inside the methods. So when I said before, <coughs> for example, defining a button, we can see there's, OK, we have a cancel button defined as for the desktop and the mobile and for the web each of which, if we click on over here, you can see the desktop button is only going to compile in the desktop. The mobile button is only going to compile in, the mo in mobile. The web button is only going to compile on the web. And then when the program needs to get back the result, it turns, it turns that object back into something that our environment needs. If I'm running on the desktop, then that particular cancel button is going to give me back the, the correct one for that particular platform. Now, again, we don't need to fuss too much about the definitions, these ones with the triangles defining what they are. We can pretty much ignore them. All they are is the definition of the object. The cool stuff is, is when you run your code. So for example, when, whenever the person starts typing in their username or their password, so if I come down here to the, the, the person enters the, the text changed into the password field, it sets the OK button to enable equaled is login enabled. Is login enabled? I was just looking at it then. 
it returns a Boolean of, well, if there's something in the text field other than blank and something in the, in the name field and the password field other than blank, it return, returns true. If, not, if that's not the case, then it returns false. So whether, whether I'm working in desktop, web or Mac, I'm working in tiny amounts of code. I don't have that code duplicated. Whether the OK button becomes enabled or not isn't in my desktop and in my web and in my uh, mobile application. It's once in this class. If I change it, it changes it across all of the environments. So I just showed you if they change the password field, same thing if they change the username field, enabled is calling that, that routine. If they press the OK button, OK button, pressed event, then, well, there's, that, that's where things are slightly different. So you can see we've got the window show command for desktop, web, and Android because they can just show a, an application, no trouble at all. They show it and we go and close the login window. For iOS, in this case, we actually need to do some, uh, some, some more work. We keep the, a copy, uh, a reference to the application, to, to the current window in current win main, and then create a new one, and then we go and push to, uh, to, push to that particular object so that we can get it back if we need. So that's a circumstance where jumping from one window to another might involve different code. But really, I mean, it's, it's, it's still all there in one place. If you're having a problem with one environment, clicking a button, you can come here, in here and just make sure everything's, everything's fine. Now, there is one area that I haven't shown you, which is the setup. And this is where, it, where when, I've, when I've now uh, got the class and I've connected it to the web, what, how does it actually work? So in the main thing we need to do is go and define all of our buttons. All these buttons and text fields and things, we need to say where they are. And that's what the, this set of objects is here. We're saying the cancel button you've got defined in your class, look to the login menu, the cancel button on that window. Password, password, login, username, login, username. OK button, OK button. The, then we need to define any events. Now at the moment, Android gives an internal error if you try and uh, do uh, uh, an ad handler within a class to something outside. It works on the others, so that's why we've got the Android exception here. But basically we're defining the ad handler here to whenever that particular object that I just defined there gets this particular event, go off and run the, the method that we've got defined in the class. So everything is all in the one area. The, de the objects themselves, the window that we're sitting on, the definition of it, all of the events are on there, any database calls are on there, everything is all sitting there in the one place. So, say for example, you wanted to do a change. You wanted to go in and add a new button on this main window. So I can come along in here and go drag a button out and put it on my window and call it, I'll just call it, uh, MBS hello if I can spell MBS hello uh, MBS hello button good that's it and I'll say hello Now, if I ran this application, it would run fine. There's a button on there, but it doesn't actually do anything. So I need to go off and put the definition of that button and what to do when it's pressed inside my application. So that's where I'm going to come out here to 
where I've got the objects here. So this saves me enormous amount of time. So I've got the definition of a button here for desktop, web and mobile. And I've got the methods for a button uh, that is, there it is, button there. And I've, I need a pressed event. So I'll just copy those to the clipboard, come back to my application, come into the class, anywhere in here, and in main and go paste. And that will add the pressed event, it'll add the, uh, the, the definitions of the button in the property and in the method. So I'm just going to go find one, two, three, four, five, six button. And what do we call it? Uh, MBS hello, I think it was. MBS hello button. And go MBS hello button. Good. And I will grab that and add that to the front of my pressed event. And come into the uh, the do setup and go I've got a new object called that I've got this thing called MBS hello button which is which I wanted to find as being sitting on top of that main window and when whenever that is pressed to go off and run I just hit the tab and there you go there's the new event I've I've got in there now the hello pressed, hello button pressed, what do I want it to do? I'm just going to type message, message box, hello from MBS. So now when I run this, I've got my, then again, Ah, can only be called, ah, so this button I've made as private, but, but when I dragged it on, by default it's private. I need to make it public because it, it needs to be public for me to be able to address it from outside. That I don't want. So now when I run my application and enter some thing, enter some text in, and you can see there's my hello button when I click on it, even though the window has no code, click on it, there you go, hello from MBS. Now, that works fine for a desktop application. Let me now go off to my web application and I'll cancel it and run it again. And it's gonna come up with an error and say, hey, you're going trying to create this thing called a hello button I don't have one of those on my page, so all I need to do is come along to my window, which is here, and drag on a new button. And I can and give it the same name, hello, MBS hello button, and I'll give it the text hello. So in other words, my skeleton of my application still remains the same. Oh, I must have hit the slash key. Well, we'll see. Uh, not now, so we'll enter in some text, hit OK, and there's the slash button. I accidentally hit hello from MBS. So you can see all of my code. I, if I wanted to change the message that appeared, I'd change it once in my class, and now that will change it for desktop, web, iOS, everything. So it has made my debugging of applications way easier and better than it used to be. Now, I know we're running out of time. We're 10 minutes to five. I know we all want to disappear. Um, does anybody have any questions? You are correct. Um, I do need to have a close event for the window uh, where, which is called up and yes, I need to add in the remove handler.
you are correct. I, I didn't think it was necessary, but I asked on the forums, do we need to do it? Is there going to be problems? And Greg alone said, yes, you're going to have serious problems. Your application will crash. So yes, that is something that you need to put back in. Any other questions? Yes? No, um, I'm not sure how you're doing it. I mean, I, I have very, I can load, I, 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 I use, as I was saying, I use lots of containers um, and with very complex applications, I'll load up one of them, um, just a, a desktop version of an application and you'll see I've got containers galore within there. Um, and, uh, for for is it Windows that is you having an issue on, or just um, no? In fact, I find it easier if if some once I've got all the objects into the container, I just move it from the left a, across. So I've got all my windows here. So well. I'll, I'll look at one like the um, invoices or something like that. So I've, I've got, you can see I've got the main window there, I've got a page panel and all of these are different containers that I have defined. So I, I can go here and just drag one of them on. Oh, so, so it's not in the IDE, it's running in the application itself. I, I have found some problems. Because I'm putting them in, in tab panels and page panels, if I go right to the limits of the tab panel or page panel, sometimes for whatever reason it unparents itself, and, uh, and yeah, but I, and that's particularly on web I've noticed. Um, why it happens and is there a... Uh, a commonality as to why it's happening, you know, sort of, I, I don't know, but I just sort of drag it off, drag it back on again, it parents itself and seems to be fine. But um, with the... Um Oh, there's ones with way, way more. The reason I use a lot of, everyone says, you know, why have you got so many timers? Well, it, so, so sometimes <coughs> it's just full of timers, like the login window and things like that. The main reason that I use so many timers, <laughs> I told you, um, is, is because of the web app. You know, desktop apps run fast, iOS apps run fast. Web apps, sometimes there's a delay in from when you click the button. It needs to do some lookup uh, with all the different login functions. So what I do is, is I go off and when, whenever somebody clicks on a button that is going to do a database lookup, I set a spinning progress wheel or um, a graffiti switch got a big one that spins in the middle and run a timer that quickly goes off and does the function I want it to do and at the end of that function it turns it all back off again. But yeah, I know, it's, it's nuts. But it works. Um, so the, the overall concept, putting everything into a class rather than keeping the code separate, does, does that seem insane or good idea? Well, when you have to work across different environments and you want to make a change once, uh, I find it makes life a lot easier. So, any other questions? Yes, Jeff? A uh, question, a comment. <clears throat> if you look at DBKit, because DBKit supports desktop and web, uh, the main class has uh, lots of you know, places where there's two method signatures, one for web and one for desktop. And for exactly the same reason, because I wanted to consolidate the code and make a change once and know that I'm updating both sides. Excellent. Yeah. So, so, so. To, just to show you some real code, so I was just looking up the invoices then, that, that's the window with all of the containers. If I look at the class, 
Now this is insane. There's just all of the different objects and things are under there, but all of the code to go off and build the, you know, go off and build the, you know, do the updates, uh, check the update buttons, any errors in it, to uh, reset all of the, the fields and things like that. Um, all of those, all of those capabilities, all the database stuff is all in one area, all the database calls. But the great thing about it is this information is only in one place. The database call for every environment is, is all together. So it's, you know, you've got a problem with a select command or an update command or something like that. It's only in one place and it's only in the class. So I fix it once, fixes it everywhere. Cool, thank you.